Okay, great. I'm going to sh share my screen and put it on the beginning here. Okay, wonderful. All right. Okay, folks, I like to give you just a brief look at the person behind the screen here. <laughs> Just so you know, it's a real human being, right? Okay, enough of that. All right. Um, so hello and welcome uh, to the uh, Reading Colors Your World Summer Reading Showcase. My name is Julie Niederhauser and I work at the Alaska State Library as the public library coordinator. Um, one of my responsibilities is to oversee the statewide summer reading program. And it's actually one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, we have just a fantastic webinar scheduled uh, for you today. We have some terrific presenters with some really innovative and um, interesting, fun uh, summer reading activities planned for their programs. And they've been so gracious, they're going to share their ideas with all of you. And so um, while you may be coming to this presentation with an empty crayon box, um, when you leave this presentation, your crayon box is going to be chock full of wonderful ideas about how you can make summer reading fun in your community. So our presenters today, and this is the order in which they will be presenting, we have MJ Grandy from the Juno Public Library. Um, Susan Jones from the Ween Public Library. My apologies to Susan. I think I sent earlier notices said just said North Star Borough. Um, obviously, the Nolween Public Library is part of the North Star Borough Libraries or North Star Borough. Um, and then we have AJ Gooden from the Igyagig um, Tribal Library. And then James Adcox from the Kenai Community Library. So all of these people have a lot of experience in providing summer reading programs and um, they all approach it really differently. And I think that's what makes this showcase so valuable is you get to see all those unique perspectives. <clears throat> so <clears throat> but before we get to the fun stuff, I have to do kind of this um, introduction, a reminder about what the statewide summer reading program is. Um, so the Alaska State Library um, has entered into a memorandum of agreement, or I'm sorry, a memorandum of understanding with iRead, uh, a nonprofit reading program ran by the Illinois Library Association. The iRead uh, reading program is designed by librarians and features adaptable and compelling themes, a comprehensive resource guide featuring, featuring inexpensive activities, and high quality graphics and reproducibles. I really think they have fantastic summer reading themes. I'm so impressed with last year's theme. And I, then again, this year's um, Reading Colors Your World just seems like the perfect theme for 2021. Um, each year, the Alaska State Library writes a grant to fund the statewide summer reading program. And this program supports public libraries offering summer reading programs in their communities. And we do this by providing libraries that register with our statewide summer reading program with a um, what we call a basic starter kit of promotional reading materials and a summer reading manual, which is it comes on a USB drive. Um, the basic starter kit, it typically includes book bags, posters, bookmarks, and reading logs. And this year, it features these beautiful glitter tattoos and this little image of the hummingbird um, is, is what one of those glitter tattoos looks like. Um, the summer reading program also offers training and program uh, programming opportunities such as today's uh, webinar. And basically these um, programs are offered to support the library staff, um, youth services librarians and the volunteers that are running these summer reading programs. So public libraries that want to participate in the statewide summer reading program, they complete an online form in the fall. Um, we put together um, a statewide um, order that is sent to iRead. It usually is submitted on December 1st. And then libraries begin receiving their materials um, around, around March 1st. So last year, the library uh, purchased a two-year license to Beanstack. Um, and this was in response to the COVID pandemic. It was closing libraries down and libraries didn't know how they were actually gonna be offering a summer reading program at all because they didn't have any access to their children or parents or teens. Um, 
And we were able to very quickly um, put up a summer reading program um, by working closely with Elizabeth Nikolai from APL Claudia, and Claudia Haynes from uh, Homer and our publication, Amy Carney, who has since moved on from the Alaska State Library. And we're very sad about that. <laughs> um, but by working together, we were actually able to provide a really high quality Alaska reading challenge for um, um, early literacy children, teens and adults. This fall, working with Samantha Blankhart, the early literacy consultant um, out of APL, we were able to put up the Alaska's 1000 Books Before Kindergarten using their fantastic graphics. And that'll be an ongoing reading challenge. And then um, this, we have a winter or spring Alaska's Tend to Try reading challenge um, that's geared for all ages and encourages them to kind of um, um, expand into new, new genres. And so we will be offering a 2021 um, Alaska Reading Challenge for summer reading. And we are looking for a couple of uh, youth services librarians, the library staff who would be willing to work with a, with a small group to come up with five activities for each of the age groups um, listed on the screen. And again, these are, we wanna come up with, you know, engaging, very inexpensive activities that um, children could do at home um, and it's not, they're, they're not going to need any special equipment or materials in order to, those, to do those programs. So if you're interested in helping with that, you can send me an email and my email is at the end of the screen here. Oh, and if you have any questions after the presentations, um, please reach out to the, to the presenters. They, um, I, they asked that I create the screen and had their contact information so that you guys can reach out to them directly. And I think that's what one of the um, goals of these presentations is not only to share ideas, but foster relationships. Okay, so thank you guys very much. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass the baton to MJ Grandy. And MJ, you want me to just bring up your slide? Yes, that would be great. Thank you, Julie, so much. Okay, let me see that. And then is there a way to share my slide and my screen with my face? There is, um, MJ, I'm going to um, do this real quick. Yes, there should be a way for you to start. Do you, see, do you have a start video? I do. Okay, if you click on start video, does it go away? No, it says that you have stopped my video. Oh, no, I didn't mean to stop your video. Okay, let's see here. Let me make you the co-host. Okay. Okay, now try it. Very good. So Hi, if you just want to tell me when to slide to the next screen, I'll, I'll do that for you. Okay, that will be great if you'll go ahead and go. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And um, I'm my first Zoom and slideshow presentation. So I wanted to acknowledge um, the anxiety with which I'm coming here today. Um, I'm not used to fitting myself into a box for a presentation, um, nor am I a linear person. So um, I really appreciate your patience. So I, um, this is sort of about summer reading, but it's also just sharing information that is my passion, which is getting people moving. And so finding books that support movement, whether you're together or apart. So that's primarily what I'm sharing today. And then just some of my other things that I'm finding very exciting. So Julie, if you'd advance. I'm starting out with books for movement. And so I've got two slides here. There's Barnyard Dance. Um, which I hope everybody is familiar with. It's a Sandra Boynton, it's very silly. And I use this quite regularly with people um, because you can actually really move. There's bowing and twirling. You get to like stand with the donkey who doesn't move anywhere and just extend it. Just get up and move and really engage with the materials. There's Build It Up and Knock It Down by Tom Hunter, which I hope you have in your collection. Um, it's the square-headed child and the round-headed child, and they move, say hello, hello, say goodbye, goodbye, um, leaning in, swinging out, and all sorts of activities. The Clap Your Hands by Lorinda Bryan Collins. 
um, Dancing Feet by Lindsey Craig, Elephants Can't Dance, which is the one that I, um, I hope that you are all using the Mo Willems materials. He is so respectful of his audience. He cares about his characters and his characters care about one another. Um, when I use this material, I frequently have whoever wants to be Piggy and whoever wants to be Gerald because kids can read this book really early on. And so we have, we engage everyone's voices in the room so that all the piggies can read together and the elephants can all read together. And then we actually do this as a dance. Um, and so I'm gonna jump here. Yesterday, Julie, in her reminder, sent out um, the plastic bag dance event. So I'm gonna move my screen so that um, we save our plastic bags that come daily. We get six of these because there's two at each library and I save them. And then you just string them together and put them on using a very traditional little like over and under. A, uh, just like you're starting, if any of you are weavers, that, that very first loop at the top of if you're doing some uh, weaving, it's the same tie on. And then you can get, I don't know if you can see, let me see if I can aim this far enough away, but it makes a totally uh, doable tutu. Um, we've done this at many activities. There was, uh, we had a, a clinket dance group that ended up wearing these over the regalia at the end of our party when we were having a community kindness festival and everybody got up and danced. The, um, Plus it keeps some of your waste out of the waste stream for a while. Uh, brown plastic garbage or grocery bags work also, not quite as colorful. It was really nice when we had the orange newspaper liners, they were fun. Um, so that's Elephants Cannot Dance. Every You can always dance better if you got the right costume on. So um, it just makes it more fun. And then the Eric Carl from Head to Toe. Um, so you get to, you know, who's got the, one of them is the buffalo and it's like, who has no neck? Everybody's got no neck, you get your shoulders up there. So you also get to kind of do your own moving in your body as you're sharing these stories. I wanted to remind everybody, I hope you all do head, shoulders, knees and toes. Kids feel so competent when you do that song. You can slow it way down low and slow. Or if you wanna do it fast, do it silent. It kind of breaks up the energy building. So you just do, and I'm sorry, you can't see my knees and toes, but barely my heads and shoulders. The other thing that's really good for kids and really hard for adults, and it really balances out the competency is do it backwards. Toes, knees, shoulders, head. It switches up the brain. It creates new pathways. It's silly and fun. Next slide, please, Julie. Again, here's head, shoulders, knees, and toes with the um, more rhymes. Here we go around the mulberry bush. We all have lots of bushes, so switch it up to what you've got. Blueberry bushes, raspberry bushes, huckleberry bushes, whatever. Go around your bush. Um, I also like bringing the bushes in to the library when possible and putting it actually in the middle of the story time so you can physically circle around the blueberry bush. Um, you can eat the blueberry blossoms early in the season. You get to eat the blueberries at the end of the season. Pete the cat, the Pete's go marching, great fun. Um, Who has wiggle waggle toes by Vicki Vicky Scheifman. Um, another really good movement book. I didn't put the publication dates on here, but it's published within the last two years. So readily available. And then I also wanted to give a plug to the story packet kits that are um, housed at LUSAC through the Ready to Read Resource Center. They have wonderful materials and frequently you can get the specifically the Alaska animals had good movement stuff in it. There are some that are specifically for movement or dance. Um, so just remember that that's in your repertoire of resources that are available. Next slide, please, Julie. Oh, and here we are with the basic instructions. And um, there we are doing head, shoulders, knees and toes with our dancing skirts on. Um, and it's just silly fun. 
I have had, um, there is a Hawaiian dance group who called them um, hula skirts. I was concerned that that would be um, disrespectful to do that. So they're tutus because I don't think the ballet is cares. Um, and I apologize. My intention today was to acknowledge the Klinket Ani, the land on which that I live and with um, the people of this place, particularly in this time of a pandemic, to give honor and respect and attention to the people who know and have lived through many, many times of great trial and survive and thrive on the lands that we share and to express gratitude for the graciousness of the sharing of this space. Um, back to the slideshow, please. Uh, so I was going through the book and looking for activities and I have always wanted to do this. So I practiced, this is my own creation of the crayon on canvas. I went through our old pile of crayons that haven't had much love in a very long time. Got the hot glue gun out, put them on. It's just a piece of um, cardboard that's from the bottom of a box that books got shipped in. Um, turned on the blow dryer. I really encourage you to put a very large piece of newsprint or a couple of them behind your activity. The, um, the wax splatters much farther than you would anticipate, um, but it was very satisfying. So I don't know if we just send it out to your families to do at home, but best thing I've done with a blow dryer in a really long time. Uh, next page, please. These I had to share. Um, they arrived in the, the mail yesterday. They are the latest productions of the Baby Raven Reads grant from the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. These, the top three on my list are books that were previously published with English exclusively. These have now been translated and are issued in uh, Lincoln um, and Small Gucks, which I believe is the um, Shimshian language. And I apologize if I am incorrect in that. Also the, the Clinket or Linket um, uh, characters. I am, have not yet linked in what the characters represent in sounds. And thankfully, um, Sea Alaska Heritage has put the translation, the translated readings in the original language on YouTube. And so you can read along and educate your ear and your eyes as you hear all these, the sounds that the words are supposed to be making. Also, you might notice that um, let's go or not to ought. Uh, I apologize again, I am learning. Um, and this, how Devil's Club came to be. Both of those, you might recognize the art at this point, Michaela Goad, the Caldecott winner of 2021, whoop, 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 um, is also the artist for those books. Um, I'm, she's a classmate of my son's. She's a fine human being. We're hoping she's going to be at the ACLA award ceremony and also speaking to um, producing indigenous materials for children um, as part of the conference. So we're awaiting confirmation, but fingers are crossed. And then also the Bow Wow Pow Wow, which was the winner of the American Indian Library Association Youth Literature Award. Um, also, you can hear it in Ojibwe. They um, shared that at the announcement ceremony. So I just wanted to, to share that. Um, it's so important in the language, both revitalization and, and reality, is that we all need to hear these words and, um, and, and learn the language that's appropriate for our town, for our community, but also just to hear so many more ways to speak than we normally have access to. Next slide, please. And these are just my inspirations. 
Juno's thinking that for our summer reading program, we're going to explore the, the rainbow and have a week for a color and end in the rainbow. And I want to encourage us all to remember the inclusion of the rainbows. Black is a rainbow color too. The poetry in this book by Angela Joy is excellent. Um, the image from cornflakes, the, it just gives me great comfort. I'd like to make one painting half as nice as my paint box left alone um, by James Stevenson. And then vivid poems and notes about color by Julie Pashkis. The artists and materials for this summer reading colors your world is spectacular. Each one of the artists renditions could have been good for everybody and to have all four of them is a bounty of wonderful things. So thank you. I think, do we have one more? Is that just my contact? There's my contact. Um, and if I may, this is not youth services. This is adult, but it's also our teens. I hope you all know about and can acquire If I Go Missing. This is a visual representation of a letter that was written by the author, Brianna Johnny, um, who is a Canadian um, First Nations person. And this was a letter she wrote to the chief of police and it's really, really important. Beautiful, beautiful and thought provoking. So thanks everybody. I think I used way more than my eight minutes. My apologies and my thanks. Okay, thank you so much, MJ. Um, so now our next presenter is gonna be Sharon. I'm sorry, Sharon, <laughs> good gracious, Susan Jones. So let me bring up her um, presentation. Okay, Susan, are you ready? I think I am. Okay, you're on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you wanna make me visible or I can be in? Let's make you visible. Um, hold on a second. Okie doke, there you go. Susan, you um, need to unmute yourself. That one. Okay, now can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, I represent the uh, quasi-technological here um, because five minutes before I started, my uh, laptop decided to go all staticky, so I quickly had to run to another machine here. Um, I'm a librarian at um, Fairbanks, and we'll just dive right into the next slide. So I wanna say thank you to everybody for participating in this program um, and to the uh, State Library for offering it. I know I've benefited in the past from um, everybody's ideas. Um, I'm a big, uh, uh, I was gonna say snitcher, but um, sharer, um, I like to use other people's ideas too. And um, please feel free as we go through slides, if you have ideas, um, put them in the chat so that we can all benefit from them. So um, the first thing I wanna say is that um, this early in February is before in, in Fairbanks that we typically have our SRP planning meetings. So nothing here is definite yet. And if my staff actually see this um, before, this is not set in stone at all, because we don't set things in stone, we set things in jello to give ourselves lots of wiggle room in the COVID world. Um, so I've been you know, looking and trying to predict what might happen this summer, to plan for our summer reading program. And I'm sort of of the opinion that not everybody will have received a vaccine by the summer and there might be even more new quick spread variations. So I'm trying to say to myself, is having programs inside the library really likely to happen? Hmm, I don't think so. Um, so I looked at thinking about three different scenarios, opened in a limited capacity, open maybe mostly fully, but not for programs and open fully. So most of what I'm gonna talk about is um, being open to the public, but not being able to do programs inside. 
So let's move to the next slide. Um, we have a lot of different sized libraries represented, I'm sure, in this um, call. Um, so you'll have to consider your community, you know, the size of your library, how much staffing you have, what kind of economics, you know, do you get money to support your summer reading program? Do you have to ask for donations? Those kinds of things are all different for all of us. Um, we do programs for basically birth through high school, but I'm going to focus on what I'm talking about on sort of the um, kind of preschool to, to school age. Um, our main attendees probably for our weekly programs that we do here are probably ages three to eight, three to nine or so. Um, and we're trying to, um, you know, look beyond just calling it summer reading now and call it summer learning um, and, you know, ways to include STEM and those kinds of things. And as um, MJ did um, so very well in what she talked about to try to be open and inclusive and diverse in what we do. So next slide. So we do an eight week program, but during the 4th of July, everybody disappears and you know has a good time and a vacation and all those things that we, we staff people don't get to do. So we're usually look for trying to fill seven weeks of programs. And I'm looking at ours as being probably all outdoors so that we can do all those socially distant kinds of things. Um, people might be familiar with um, a, sort of a registered trademark kind of program called Story Walk, where you take um, books and you kind of um, dismantle them into two page spreads and spread them out, um, oftentimes outdoors, um, some distance from each other, and people walk along and read the story sort of increment by increment. Um, we sort of took the, the story walk concept, but decided to not use that necessarily trademark kind of name. And ours is probably going to be called Story Saunter. Um, and uh, we'll probably try to do that for one week here in Fairbanks. We have um, a story garden right outside the children's area here and a park right behind the library. So we'll spread out our stories in those areas. We do have to, to take them down at the end of each day because unfortunately we're subject to vandalism otherwise. Um, we tried it last year with some temporary kind of holders, um, kind of just laminated them and stuck them out there and um, people did seem to enjoy it. The thing that we want to try to do is make it more than just reading. So we try to give some instructions with maybe some movements people can do or some singing or maybe drawing in the dirt or jumping around um, to sort of expand on just the book itself. So um, uh, one of the uh, artists for this year is, I think he pronounces his name, Hervé Toulet. Um, so his book, uh, Press Here, um, is one under consideration. Um, Rainbow Fish, and um, of course, the classic Brown Bear, Brown Bear, um, which actually lends itself very nicely because every two page spread um, then kind of leads you to the next um, two page spread and with the story walk, you'd walk along a path or something to get to that. Okay, uh, next one. So um, what would summer reading be without a scavenger hunt for colors? Because reading colors your world. Um, again, remember that none of these are set in stone and not really finalized in any way, shape or form. So I'm trying to think, how could we do a scavenger hunt? You know, we could have a grid. You could have kids do things with their favorite colors. You could look for colors in nature. Um, I put a sample of a scavenger hunt that we used last year um, in 2020, where you don't have to find something specific. Um, you're just kind of finding things that match the criteria here. So you're going to find something that's rough, find something bigger than a car, find something squishy, find something yummy. And you don't actually um, keep it or anything. You just check it off. Um, and to go back to um, the story walk, um, the copyright doesn't seem to be an issue. We bought two copies of um, the book so that we are um, deconstructing the physical books. Um, and as far as I know, um, there's no copyright issues, but there is a, the formal program called Story Walk. Um, and if you Google it, you'll get the information um, about uh, how it is, is formally done. So let's move on um, to another idea for a program. Um, traditionally in Fairbanks, we have done an outdoor day every year. So to keep that social distancing, 
Um, we're gonna try maybe to have an outdoor day again um, with just some simple things like sidewalk chalk drawing. Um, kids can draw whatever they want or you could create patterns where they could color them in. Um, uh, bubbles, um, you have that iridescence with the bubbles where you get the, the multicolors. Um, we would probably buy bubble soap, but you can, you can Google online to find how to make it. Um, so that's a, a consideration for us. And another slide. And uh, we've done music concerts in the past and those lend themselves to having people uh, keep that social distance. Um, we happen to have a library staff member who belongs to a steel drums group called Pantheon. Um, so we're hoping to involve them and the audience can be dancing, they can be listening, um, they can just be moving um, like MJ is trying to get people to do. Um, so that's another thought. Next slide. Um, back in, I don't remember what year, um, the Collaborative Summer Library Program had a theme called Fizzboom Read, um, and it was really science oriented. So the staff that year um, wore those goofy, um, quite kind of um, interesting wigs, and they did a mad scientist program where they um, did uh, science demonstrations, but also involved the audience. Um, and it was really fun and pretty cool. So when I was flipping through the manual, um, I noticed that they had this science experiment called walking colors. And so um, you take um, basically a clear cup and you put a drop of food coloring in the bottom. And I have three different colors here. Um, and you add water to it. And then you fold up a ever so cheap paper towel, cheaper the better. And then you, um, this without dropping, you um, put your paper towel in your two colors and you put the other end of the paper towel in the middle and the water walks through the paper towels. Um, mine hasn't been going very long, so my blue has not yet um, uh, turned into blue, but um, as you can see from the, um, the cups there, um, it does move. So it's not something you'd probably do live because that's way too slow for the kids to um, in, endure hours of it but um, it is a, a fun kind of experiment. So I'm thinking that we might do that virtually um, for a mad scientist program. Next slide, please. Um, we'd probably also um, try to get some sort of paid performer um, or maybe a local presenter. We have a, a couple here in town who um, has a lot of cool reptiles. There's some snakes there. Um, they have an albino alligator. Um, and last summer they did a virtual program for us and showed us their house actually where all the animals are, which was a, a nice um, alternative. Um, animals are always popular. So for us, any way that we can incorporate animals and of course the best way is when you can, you know, touch them and pet them, um, but that's probably not gonna happen. Okay, next slide. Um, so last year we did this and we'll probably do it again this year. Um, a take and make bag so that it might contain weekly crafts that correspond with all the programs we do for all seven weeks. So we tried to put all the, the crafts in one bag so that people only had to come and pick it up one time. Um, magazines always have a lot of different colors and you can make beads from magazines by just rolling up the strips of paper. I don't know how I would incorporate the color wheel craft yet. It just sounded like a good idea. And if we have extra money and can buy some reversible sequin fabric, we just cut up a little swatch and include that in the take and make just so that kids can run their fingers around it. Next slide, please. Um, so the Aurora Borealis of course is um, super colorful and I'm going to try to quickly just tell you how you can easily make, a, um, make an Aurora. So you take a black sheet of construction paper and you cut out with scrap paper and you put it on top. And then you take your piece of chalk and you rub really hard on your white piece of paper. Let me just do that really quick. And then you take a Kleenex and you brush it up against the black and it 
does better than I did just now. And then you're left with a lovely, you can't really see it at all on my piece of paper here, but you can see from the picture, it makes a cool Aurora picture. So um, that's a craft um, that we're considering. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know why in my right mind I'm considering this, but if we include a piece of muslin square in the craft bag, people can take it home and we'll include some markers. They could crayon on it, marker on it, fabric paint, sew things on and return it to us and maybe we'll make a quilt. Ah, okay. Next slide. Um, something that uh, everybody can do, um, you could give them a piece of paper and um, have them cut out in the shape of kind of a crest and have them mark things that are important to their family. So what's important to me is music, pizza, books, and berries or other kinds of food. Okay, next slide. Um, in the manual, um, I don't know why this attracted my attention, but you know, there's always those annoying stickers on fruits and vegetables that have the barcodes on them. So um, to encourage healthy eating, next slide, please. People can, um, on a chart, uh, move those little stickers into a grid to show all the healthy stuff that they're eating. And you learn about what the stickers mean and how it actually has some real meaning believe it or not, but that sounds kind of boring now, I see it, but that's okay. Next slide, please. Um, Upstart, uh, when we worked with Upstart, um, offered us, or there was an option of getting a mystery sticker where um, it's a big design and then people stick colored stickers on it over time and eventually it um, fills in and makes a cool design. So I'm trying to think of how we can do that this year um, that's just a butterfly. We did a space one one year. Um, it's from a company called Let, Let Stick Together. Next slide, please. And uh, minerals, rocks, and gems are also colorful. And um, we might be able to borrow a kit from the museum here in Fairbanks, um, but I'm trying to figure out a way to, to involve those um, in something that we do. And um, I haven't figured it out yet, but if you have any ideas, let me know. Next slide, please. And um, well, you know, what is any sort of program without a rubber chicken? So Julie, could you click on the Jingle Bells rubber chicken there for me? Well, maybe it's not gonna link. I don't know. Um, it's, it's, uh, the rubber chicken is something you can buy from iReads, and this happens to be a rubber chicken that sings jingle bells. Um, so you'll just have to imagine um, it happening. I could I could try to be a rubber chicken, but um, I'll just skip that for now. And next slide, please. Or are we stuck in rubber chicken mode? Okay, well, um, I think we're close to the end anyway. So let me just make sure that there's not much after the rubber chicken. Nope. Um, we also did an essay contest where we asked kids to write about um, what a book means to them. And that's the end for me. Um, so thank you for listening. And um, if you have uh, cool ideas, please share them. And um, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. Sorry about the getting stuck in the, the rubber chicken part there. Okay, so next is AJ. And AJ, um, I think you can go ahead and share. Okay, hi everybody. All right, are you able to see that? Yes, we can. Awesome. All right, so, um, just to introduce where our library is at, we're at the west end of Lake Iliamna, about 250 miles southwest of Anchorage, and there's a bird's eye view of the village. Igiagig, which means the, it means Igiagig mute means the place where the, um, the river swallows the lake. So it's like a throat and And our actually housed in the school, the building with the 
red roof there. We have a, a community of about 65 people. And because we're so isolated, um, we will have the advantage of being able to have programs in the library in our small groups. So a lot of our plans are looking that way. Also, they can be adapted and we can do things outside um, if needed. So we're, uh, I'm, I'm going to do my best to incorporate the Yupik language, which uh, the village of Igiagig is working very hard to revitalize. And so I had a lovely lady named Sasa Peterson help me to um, translate the titles, although I, I'll do my best to pronounce them. And the goal is to, throughout the programs that we do to reinforce some simple language, like these color words, for example. Uh, Mingluk is colors in Yupik. And so um, the village of Igiagig is in the Lakin Peninsula School District, which is on a subsistence uh, school calendar. So they're out of school at the end of April and don't start until after Labor Day. It's actually um, really awesome. But the library is trying to help with uh, summer slide concerns. And so we have planned three programs um, through the months of May, June, July, and August. So we have themes going for each month. And the first one is just to have a lot of fun with colors and um, process art. The kids will have you know, just finished up um, school, all that structure and so we're intending to have a lot of fun. So up in the, the corner, you can see the books that we plan to incorporate into the program. And then the activities that we'll do a sort of a center-based activity. So also the activities are family oriented. So usually have older siblings or parents come with younger children. And so we'll have different stations set up, one with string art and this um, cool dot to dot and then marble painting. And um, for anyone who is interested, I have a Word document with all of the materials that are required for each of the activities shown on the slide, as well as the link to the directions, the website link where I uh, found the activity. I'd be happy to send it to anybody who wants it. So this would be a program for one week. And next week we'd focus on um, doing crafts with crayons and markers and with a story, um, my crayons talk. Melted crayon art is super fun. Some of you may have seen it done on rocks before. You can also heat rocks in the oven. Um, you just have to be careful with your age group when you do that. That's something we've done before, but I learned about this new method of just covering a griddle with some tin foil and turning it on super low. And that way you don't have to worry about children getting burned on the hot rocks or the cookie sheet or whatever you're using cooling off. So you can, you know, these particular activities are not very expensive because they're mostly things that we have on hand, construction paper and crayons and coffee filters. But they allow a lot of experimentation and the kids just to have fun with the color. And then for the third, our third week in May, I found these cool Play-Doh mandalas. Um, and we have a, you know, we make our own Play-Doh with this excellent recipe that I'd be happy to share. And again, it's just a way for the kids to relax and have fun. And my goal with this particular book, The Festival of Colors, is to help the kids learn about this um, cool festival in India. Holy, I think it is called. Um, and they make all these different colors from flowers, dried flowers, and throw them at each other for a couple of days and just relish the color around them. And so these activities are, might require a little, you know, they're, they're just different. They're not paint and crayons. They're a little more um, hands-on. The tissue paper sun catchers are made with wax paper. And uh, you could use a paper plate instead of a wooden hoop if cost 
you know, is an issue because we have such small numbers, we're fortunate that way we can, you know, buy some of these materials that would be cost prohibitive for larger programs. And then they can take these home and share these items. The paint chip paper beads, I have never tried, but like Susan was saying, you can make paper beads with the magazines. Um, you can get paint chip samples from Lowe's or Home Depot, wherever. And there's a tutorial that it, a simple tutorial explains how to do it. And I think it's something that all the kids would enjoy and adults as well. Aputet mingugamak, which means questions about color. So for um, June, we're thinking of having a science theme and um, I, we haven't pulled anyone yet, but we thought we might ask the young and old patrons what questions they have about color and then try to tailor the programs to answer their questions. But here are some things we have to start with. What makes color? And there are tons of great books. Here are three that we'll incorporate. And again, we'll have these stations during the program talking about how light works um, using, you know, learning some scientific terms and also um, it's just interesting to note there's an, like an ongoing debate in the scientific world. I learned in my research for this that some scientists say that color is an inherent physical quality and no matter while others say that it depends on, you know, the, the light being shown on the object, because, you know, if you shine a red flashlight on a blue book, it's not blue anymore, it's black. Anyway, that is a kind of this mind boggling question that interested me while I was researching this. And so we have fun exploring some concepts about color and I don't have a picture. Well, anyway, the directions for the beaded prism sun catcher would be super easy to make. Um, and the directions are in the, the Word document I can share if you want, but you get the crystal, they're glass crystals and you can get 20 for 10 bucks or something like that on Amazon and fishing string and whatever beads you have laying around and then people can hang them up in their window and have rainbows around the house through the beautiful summer sun let's see all right the next week we would talk about some of the um conditions that people experience when they see color differently um achromatopsia and also color vision deficiency was which is actually it's known as color blindness but that's technically not true and then synesthesia is a super interesting um, way of engaging with the world. If you aren't familiar with it, there are some awesome books and also some young adult books. Um, when you, it's the, the ability to see, um, when you see something you also, or hear a sound, you also see a color or, and it can, it's like a mixing of the senses and it's really interesting. And some of us or most, you know, all of us have it to some degree, but there are some people who experience it more strongly. And so that would, I thought that would be a really fun thing to explore. So the activity for that would be playing all these different kinds of music, uh, different short samples and um, having people draw a color to represent what they hear, color, shape, whatever they have, you know, writing, um, tools on the table with them in their paper. And then we can just talk about that experience while after sharing um, some of these books. Mingwa is eye color. And so for the next month, we're gonna focus on artists and experimenting with some of the, you know, doing some artwork inspired by artists who some of their work is really focused on color. I mean, all artists, of course, are using that. There are some people who really take advantage of it. Um, like Kandinsky. So it's a simple square kids make with oil pastels or even just round cutouts of paper. 
and then put them together in a quilt like um, design. And the idea is that with all of the artwork the kids do, we'll you know put it on display for patrons to enjoy and then they can take it home the following week or whatever. So here's a great, and there are lots of, there are tons of good children's books that will do children to these artists in their, during their childhood uh, and help you know them to relate to the artists. And then some simple activities you can do that are not very expensive, but are um, allow for a lot of creativity and self-expression. Here, um, Georgia O'Keeffe and the flower tissue paper. It's just starch and tissue paper. And and then Roy Lichtenstein, a portrait inspired by his his style, his pop art style. And then our last month, the theme would be focused on um, local color. That's Mingui um, Nu the colors of our world. And so my hope for this, for kind of as a, a celebratory um, activities at the end of our summer reading program, we would do a couple of things. Um, there are some, some of you may be familiar with landscape artists, um, earth art, land art, where you just use found objects in the outside to create these cool works of art. So I, the idea is to start out with a slideshow and introduce the um, participants at the, at the program with some of the land art that's been created all over the place and inspire them. Then we'll go outside on a field trip and and make our own and take pictures to um, document and then share with other people in the region and within our own community. Um, and another idea with this is as an ongoing project to focus on colors that are in our local environment and to enjoy them to um, at the beginning of summer reading, I don't have the advertising done for this, but invite people to snap pictures. People love to do that. You know, they're posting pictures all the time, Facebook and Instagram and to have them um, be really focused on color and, and snap some good pictures so that we could incorporate those into some sort of community photo book at the end of the summer reading. And for our really little young patrons and, and old ones, I have some older, you know, um, teenage patrons who enjoy playing with these materials too. These are things that we have on hand already. Um, they are a little expensive if you don't already have them, but they're fun to play with. These wooden rainbow blocks, um, you can do all sorts of things with them and they're fun and they go beautifully with our theme. And this, you know, the children can interact with them and set them up as display and, and then you know, someone else can come along and play with them. Also these linking discs and magnetic tiles. And the tiles are cool because you can actually do color mixing with them. And, you know, when you put a, you know, um, two tiles together, you can see another color. So that's another fun aspect of those magnetic tiles. Here's my contact information. And I'd be very happy to share the Word document that contains all the material list and the books and the websites for each of those activities. Thank you for sharing your time with us today and happy reading. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we have James um, Adcox from the Kenai Community Library. James, you wanna share? Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen here. There, can everyone see that, I hope? So I'll go ahead and share my video here too. Great, hey guys, first of all, uh, wonderful job to the presenters. I've taken down so much notes. I've got multiple pages here, very excited about everything I'm learning about today. So I'm gonna share uh, today specifically about um, teens and tween programming for your library and uh, break that down into a couple of categories here. Um, like some of the presenters mentioned earlier, 
uh, we are having to balance. I really like that phrase where it's not set in stone, it's set in jello because with, with COVID, um, the Kenai Community Library is, is really at a point of juggling what we think we can do as to what we maybe can do and um, trying to figure out what we're gonna do with that. So um, let's go ahead and let me go ahead and move to the next slide. There we go. Um, so one thing that we know we can do is DIY kits. And this is something that our library has started about three years ago, uh, pre-COVID and found it to be very successful with teens and adults for our summer reading program. And when COVID hit, we just adapted it um, more regularly to be able to distribute that for most of 2020. Uh, when people would come for a curbside service, they could also pick up a DIY kit. Um, so the way I, I kind of broke it down here is DIY kits are wonderful alternative to in-house uh, programming, provide fun, all kinds of fun things and educational opportunities for teens and tweens, since we're gonna focus on them. Uh, they're also fun to make. So I mentioned a couple of things here in terms of if your library is choosing to perhaps make some DIY kits, um, here are some, some helpful hints over the last three years that we learned. Um, and I, I got to give a shout out to uh, Mary Jo and Brianna Thurman for, for really starting this and, and making it pick up steam over the last few years for our teams. So uh, number one, be creative. When designing your kits, um, origami and coloring pages are cool, but with a theme like Reading Colors Your World, um, I think we can think outside the box and really come up with some, some really cool things that really are, are exciting for our teams. But you have to balance that with being simple. Um, balancing the creativity with simplicity keeps, uh, some, keeps it straightforward. Um, you can cut down on your expensive material fees and labor intensive preparation. So as you're preparing all these recycled material, if possible, such as paper towel tubes, um, nice shopping bags for anyone who lives in a, a community where they're giving out some of these paper bags with handles, we try and save those. Uh, DVD cases, old CDs or CD-ROMs, those kind of things. And I can say that by offering these kits um, throughout the course of 2020, um, a lot of it has to do with just printed materials um, and then offering maybe crayons here or there. We made one purchase of a large pack of uh, small uh, little glues, a uh, large pack of, of individually wrapped three crayon little things, um, a lot of things that maybe restaurants would have when they dish out menus. So to order um, that kind of thing really kind of cuts down on, on having to individually design. We just had a, a slew of different materials that we knew we could incorporate into it. Um, and the last thing I said, be educated. And I'm not referring to making every kit educational, but be educated as the librarian to know how many kits you think you might need to make. Um, what we did was look at past year statistics to help us guesstimate the number of kits to prepare. Um, also, you don't have to offer new kits weekly. Our summer reading program, we run for about 10 weeks through the summer months. To make 10 DIY kits for adults and teens, it would be a lot of work. We break it down to offer it every, every other week. So we're only making five different kits throughout the summer months. And looking at the numbers, our libraries, I would say a medium size, uh, perhaps library, maybe roughly within the state. And we were making about 100 kits um, every two weeks for children and 60 kits for teens and adults every two weeks with uh, five variations on those kits, all prepared in advance. I'll go ahead and move the next slide. Oops. There we go. And so here are some do-it-yourself kit ideas for teens and tweens. Uh, one is, uh, so I'll kind of break them down too onto some that might have a little bit of a, a cost associated with it, others that might be free. Um, so a scratch board with enclosed toothpick, um, I think is a lot of fun because you can get scratch boards that are both, um, it's, for those that aren't familiar with scratch boards, it's a, a, a white board with uh, India ink or black ink over the top of it, but they're not always white. Some of them are very colorful underneath, so you can certainly pick up scratch boards that are real colorful and offer some kind of scratching tool with it. 3D paper with 3D glasses. I put a picture of that. That is a lot of fun. I teach drawing classes he, uh, here at the community library um, when we were running programs, and we did a whole class using this 3D paper and 3D glasses 
And so you're just using a black Sharpie marker over this 3D paper, but when you put the glasses on, your drawing really comes off the page. Super fun. The paper's about half size sheets, and so they can fit in any kind of DIY bag with the glasses. Um, so there is a little expense to that one if you're um, if you had the budget for that. And then making your own comic book diary, we recycled materials to make that, and then just put a, a little. I'll go into that in more detail with our programming. Pop up cards would be a low cost. Um, designing your own Fortnite character or graphic novel character. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, Fortnite's a, a video game that's pretty popular right now with our teen population, but it's really creative characters. And of course, graphic novels have very creative characters and very visual. Um, so one thing we would do in some of our DIY kits is offer a, you design your own uh, character and we wanna see what you come up with. And it's a lot of fun. And then making your own modern, Art Mobile, based on the work of Alexander Calder. We just were looking up some artists, and I really um, enjoyed how AJ had some books about artists that she was presenting. So many great uh, old masters out there, or contemporary artists, or modern artists uh, like Alexander Calder that are super colorful, uh, that you can kind of look at ideas. And we thought a mobile could be kind of a fun idea. We have to see how we end up doing that one. Uh, let's move on to a few more ideas. You, could, of course, can make your own kaleidoscope, and um, some staff are already saving up these uh, tubular Kleenex boxes for that. We're hoping we can round up enough tubes to make that happen for the summer. I guess it doesn't hurt to start now gathering those um, recyclable materials. And uh, another staff of mine found snowflakes and rainbows um, CD art, uh, and it's something like the prisms that were discussed earlier, where you're using recycled uh, CDs um, or CD-ROMs and and you're making a snowflake over the top to have cast a very cool uh, shadow or a really a, a cool rainbow reflection on the wall that has a, a kind of a snowflake pattern to it. So we thought that might be a really fun uh, DIY kit to take home. Blackout poetry, uh, nothing new, but a lot, a lot of fun and something that you can use uh, recycled books, old books for that could be fun. Uh, we also thought of de-stress kits. Um, just with everything going on with teens and having to work from home um, with, with uh, uh, school and, and just pretty much the pandemic as a stress, as a stressor, a de-stress kit might be a fun idea for a DIY kit for teens and tweens that might include a bubble wrap that they can pop or uh, making your own um, kind of de-stress ball that you can squeeze could be fun also. And then I put uh, as the last one here, an escape room in an envelope. And what is an escape room in an envelope? Um, I'm glad you asked. So it is, uh, it's an escape room. And I, I, a lot of libraries have hosted escape rooms for teens and tweens and uh, have one uh, staff member that's really great at making different riddles and clues and ciphers and all kinds of cool um, little mysteries in a bag or in an envelope. And so here are a couple of posters of some we've tested out in 2020, and we're, we're planning on making a few uh, for our summer months as well. And these are popular with teens, with adults, and then uh, there are some that we, we catered towards even our younger audiences. Um, so the way they work is they are kind of like an escape room. It, it offers an escape room experience that people can pick up from your library, take home, they don't need to return it. This is, we make, uh, it's all printed material. So it's really just a lot of photocopying um, and putting them in a bag. We, uh, in other words, we establish a theme and a challenge of the escape room and then offer printed clues, riddles, ciphers, optical illusions um, to finding out the solution to the mystery. Sometimes the packaging itself can be part of the mystery, such as stamps on the envelope, candy wrappers, generated news clippings, things like that. Uh, these escape rooms can be distributed curbside if your library is not open. They can be distributed at the circulation desk um, or shared virtually. So I did want to just take a moment to talk about, I helped design the Can You Beat Batman? Race Against the World's Greatest Detective to Solve the Prince of Gotham Mystery. And so that one's catered towards our younger audiences and up, but I know that teens did it as well. And we promoted this and handed it out and mentioned that the solution will be revealed on YouTube and Facebook. Um, so can you solve it before we reveal the solution? I think this is in September. And um, 
another way that we we did that was if they chose not to come into the library to pick up the the escape room in a bag or through a curbside service they could print it if they had those capabilities through our facebook so we put all the forms that you would need and all the clues um, on our facebook and said well here's here's a, a virtual handouts for you to use and then because i'm a big batman fan and a complete dork i have a, f a huge batman costume and so we filmed our solution with Batman solving the same clues that all the kids and teens were given, except he went through it and solved it. And um, so we filmed that and then just posted the video as the solution on Facebook and YouTube. And I got to tell you, it was a lot of fun. Um, let's move on. And now I'm going to just take a, a little bit to talk about teen and tween uh, virtual programming and what that might look like. Um, so we all have experience in developing virtual programming now through COVID, and whether you develop new programming or adapt your existing programming to a virtual platform or both, it can still be difficult to draw teens. And in my opinion, it's easier to draw a tween audience, whether virtual or in-house or not. Uh, tweens are just usually a little bit more um, willing to participate in those programs. So it, it doesn't help that it's very difficult to accurately track teen involvement with virtual programs. And when I mention virtual programs, I'm talking about programming that we're offering through social media or programming that we're offering through um, YouTube. And I put a couple of things here, Zoom and, and uh, WebEx and Kahoot. And all these are wonderful ways of reaching out to the community, both teen, tween, adult. Um, but let's examine interactive versus pre-filmed. Um, and I think it helps as a, as a library to examine what you're doing to reach out. Are you only pre-filming all your virtual programming and then posting it to social media? Or are you trying some interactive uh, programming? So the benefits to pre-filmed is it's typically easier. Uh, it can offer greater production value. You can have fun with video effects. If, if you've uh, invested in virtual programming, you might have green screen or um, video editing capabilities that you can have a lot of fun with. Um, but is that the best way for a given program? The benefits to interactive programming, such as uh, maybe a trivia using Kahoot or Google Docs, uh, or a Zoom meeting that offers a Steam lesson or WebEx meeting that offers a more dynamic experience, is that it's much more social for the participants. Um, we've had the privilege of hosting STEAM programming once a month with the local school and walking away from that experience, even as the instructor, it's more rewarding as well because I get to see them participate. I get to see their excitement towards whatever it is we might be doing. Um, so it's just a different feel. And I know that, that kids are exposed to Zoom meetings and interactive classrooms all the time. And it might be something that's a little dry for them right now. So if you keep it maybe something that really sparks their interest, um, that perhaps you can draw that audience, that teen and tween audience. Um, so I'm just going to give a shout out to Kodiak. I sat in on one of their trivia nights just for a brief moment before my computer died. But a uh, wonderful job that they're doing with their adults using interactive um, Zoom meeting and Google Docs to make a wonderful trivia nights. And I thought that's a, a great idea for teens. We're going to test that out um, in February. And um, we're just kind of thinking of themes that might draw teens in. And one theme that we could all use is the Reading Colors Your World theme was a super exciting theme uh, for myself, um, just as someone who enjoys painting and drawing. I loved this idea. And so as the youth service coordinator, we're, we're really looking at, at focusing the Reading Colors Your World on art, artists, and, um, and art projects. And so uh, teens and tweens are very artsy, sometimes more fartsy than artsy, but they're very creative. Uh, they love cool projects and experiments and cool cooking projects, games, and being social. So I made a list of some possible virtual programming that that uh, we might consider. So one thing that we are considering is that trivia night, very interactive and it could be a lot of fun. And then perhaps some tutorials on, on making a movie itself now that we've kind of invested and have learned 
um, how to make some effective movies, stop motion movies and things like that. It might be fun to offer that as a program. Um, and tutorials can be something that you may want to consider, you know, is this a very um, relevant subject to a teen audience? Cardboard cosplay, we have not done, but we're looking forward to, we've seen other libraries try it and that looks really exciting. So we're thinking we might try that one. Um, abstract art with cardboard squares. We've included a picture there that you might see. Um, I thought that was kind of a fun idea to make sculptures just using colorful cardboard. And it seems simple. That is maybe something that could be um, translated to a DIY kit also. Uh, oil painting demonstrations, uh, charcoal portrait demonstrations. Um, and so I was just gonna kind of throw out, so you could, I just cut out some programs that we've tried here and I added the links to those, but in the oil painting portrait demonstration, uh, I'm a I'm a oil painter and a portrait painter. So I just filmed myself doing it, but not every librarian uh, paints in oil paints or, or is, is um, familiar with artistic mediums. So I was just going to suggest that you can certainly ask a local artist in your community and see if they might be willing to um, allow or have them perhaps film themselves for a demonstration um, or see if they might be willing to just show kind of what they do. If you're doing in-house programming, a wonderful interview would be fantastic with a local artist. So just want to encourage you guys to maybe reach out to local artists. And then the how to make a comic book diary, I included the YouTube link there, was so much fun to make. Um, this was a DIY give out, giveaway, and then we converted it to a virtual programming by simply making a tutorial video out of what we were handing out. Um, and the tutorial video concentrated on kind of in, in the style of, of Diary of Wimpy Kid, but how you can make a comic book character of yourself. And then for the next 30 days, perhaps you could draw a sequential arts of what you, you've been doing for the next, last 30 days. Or we kind of in, inspired them to maybe revisit it, take a break after a while, you know, kind of thing. But the video was fun to make. The handouts were fun to make. And um, it was uh, a, a program that we saw some success in terms of a lot of kids and teens grabbing that. Um, some other ones, the reject toy drawing activity. We tried uh, this, so I put the link in there, and that was a, a lot of fun. And it's just a simple drawing activity. There's so many good just warm up drawing activities that you could post virtually for virtual programming. Um, and if you're not familiar, I don't feel comfortable. This does not take um, artistic ability to do it. Um, it's just uh, looking at how. It's done and then perhaps in this case we had to include um, some other staff members to do it because it's kind of uh, the reject toy drawing activity is kind of like a um, kind of like a game of telephone where you whisper something uh, to someone and then they keep um, whispering it down the line it's like that but it's a drawing so you start with the head and then the next person draws the torso the next person draws the right arm and the left arm and and then the final person names the reject toy and it's a lot of fun um, and then we thought we definitely want to include science and we have a, a staff member who's um, really fun at making uh, science exciting and has experience in making virtual programming and uh, one program that she was hoping to do this summer is with acids and bases because it's a very colorful science experiment so um, and that is drawing and being artistic with acids and bases and I put homemade fudge because uh, there's certainly so many great cooking, virtual cooking classes that can be offered. Um, and of course, there are a lot of classes that can be offered uh, in all capacities from your library. And you might think you're competing with a, a world of great YouTube um, virtual classes already, but a lot of people want to see the library staff. Um, they know the library staff, you're members of the community, and they enjoy seeing you teach. And so I just wanna encourage you that even though it might be done and maybe there's a better video of it on YouTube, it, it still doesn't hurt to try to make your own instructional video and post that. And I think a lot of cooking classes will, will be a, a, a hit, I predict with just some fun, colorful classes there. A virtual art gallery I put down here as something um, with, with COVID going on, um, there's a lot of young teenage artists out there that have been producing and it would be fun to be able to showcase some of what they made um, while they were 
uh, either hunkered down or in quarantine or um, they're at home during COVID. Um, I thought that might be a fun uh, virtual type of, of programming. And then the online scavenger hunts, I know a lot of libraries have, have done that. And uh, one thing that we were just gonna make note of is that if you use QR codes um, that can minimize touching the actual clues um, and just be scanning the clues. Um, and that is a fun program that you can collaborate if you have a local parks and rec, um, you can certainly collaborate with them on a scavenger hunt using the parks. So I'll move on here. Uh, incentives and giveaways, you know, I added the pizza there uh, because, you know, one way that, that the Kenai Library would love to, to draw in teens and tweens is with food, but I don't predict a lot of our teen and tween programming will hap be happening in-house um, this summer, unfortunately. Uh, so with that in mind, we've kind of had to shift gears with how do we incorporate perhaps some incentives. Um, and that's a variety of ways. One is with your uh, do-it-yourself uh, packs that you might be distributing, um, you, can, you can mention that if you take a picture of it, uh, you can send an email, um, or you can stop in and show us, you would be entered in to win a, a given prize. And that certainly doesn't, doesn't hurt uh, to offer an incentive that I think that would only boost your numbers. And I know that, that some librarians, uh, you know, might not be on board with incentives, uh, but from, from my experience, um, I have seen uh, greater teen involvement in our summer reading programs with uh, incentives being offered. And I know that um, incentives can be costly, but they don't all have to be. Um, asking local businesses for free coupons, gift cards, or swag, um, even a simple uh, $5 coffee card can go a long way if you have participants um, getting drawn uh, once a week. I encourage you to be uh, creative in, in adding your incentives to any DIY kits or virtual programming. Um, that can really help uh, kind of just motivate some of those young people to get involved there. And then, and then giveaways. Um, if your, your city or community um, or your library has merchandise or swag, it never hurts to throw out just a couple of fun, um, maybe counting the jelly beans in a jar at your circulation desk, um, which is, of course, is very colorful. Or those kind of giveaways just to get people excited about it and maybe and, you know maybe just something small that you can offer with that so just want to encourage some of that um in the last slide um i was just going to promote um steam kits for those libraries that are offering kits already and a shout out to anchorage um, for uh, really helping the kenai library uh, start our steam kits um, but some of those steam kits though they might typically be um, directed towards a younger audience, definitely have some uh, subjects that are appropriate for a teen audience. And perhaps the summer is a great time to advertise uh, those tween and teen steam kits, um, such as Ozobots, or we have a drawing kit that I think adults would, would be um, happy to check out. Uh, we have a marble run. I have a, a young tween, I guess. And he loved the marble run. He spent hours with it. So um, I know that those some kits might be directed towards a younger audience that teens can certainly appreciate it too. And then um, with the advertising, I was just going to mention that uh, it, you really just want to show that your library cares about the teen population in your community using the radio, local chamber, social media. Uh, get the word out that you care um, and promote uh, perhaps reader's advisory, um, promote the teen area in your library, new teen books, those kind of things. So, and uh, just my compliments to all you children's librarians running summer reading program. Uh, I know it's a lot of work and super fun and rewarding. And just, uh, I know you guys have great ideas and tons of ideas. And uh, please feel free to share those ideas in the chat because I am always scribbling them down. So here is my information there and welcome any questions there too. Okay, um, I just, wow, it was just amazing presentation. And I was so happy to see we kept almost all the participants and we even gained a few after we went past an hour. So that's awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, do we wanna spend a couple minutes, uh, at least four more minutes um, answering any questions people may have? 
Sure, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has them. Okay, let's see. Um, there was a question, uh, James, is the comic book diary tutorial still available? Uh, yes, so the comic diary, uh, everything that we posted on Facebook and YouTube is still accessible. Um, and it's, it is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat box. Um, unfortunately, with this setup, we can't have everybody um, unmute and share. So if you have a question, if you'd like to enter it in the Q&A or in the chat, we have presenters who are willing to stay and answer a few questions. Lots of compliments in the chat box. And Julie, if I may, if anybody has any ideas of what they want to add to the summer reading program, if you don't want to be like on an organizer for putting something together, but you have an idea like I'd love, we did this in our community. If you'd send those to Julie, that would be great too. Yes, I will be happy to share those out along with copies of the presentations that I have. Um, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted to the Alaska State Library page and I'll send out a notice on ACLA when this um, presentation is the recording is posted because we've gotten so many comments from people who wanted to attend but were unable to due to scheduling issues. So, okay. And one more plea, if you'd like to be a part of a group who comes up with ideas for the um, activities for Beanstack, I'm looking for a few good volunteers. And I've, I've got two in mind, but I could use a few more. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording. And um, I wanna, again, thank my fantastic presenters. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to make this an annual event. Um, this is so fun. Okay, here we go, stopping the recording.